Good morning. It is quarter past seven on a Tuesday morning and I am taking the van to a garage in Nuneaton. The van is due its annual MOT safety check. It also might as well have a service. And as I think I mentioned in a previous video, the aircon has packed up. It's only blowing warm air, so that might as well get looked at. I have a feeling it's going to be an expensive morning. I'm taking the van to a place I have used many times before. It's a Peugeot specialist, independent garage, uh, because, of course, the van, notwithstanding it being badged Toyota, is actually a rebadged Peugeot Citroen. Um, and this place not only is a Peugeot specialist, but also does motorhomes and camper vans and things. So no better place, I think, to take this homebrew, self-built camper van for a bit of a wash and polish up and a general bit of TLC. Off I went along the A5 to Nuneaton. Arriving at CV11 6RZ on the left. It's a Peugeot specialist whose name is the Peugeot Specialist, so you're never in any doubt as to what they do. A few hours later and the van has passed its MOT in pretty good shape. It's also had its service. Unfortunately, the aircon is a leak in the condenser, so they need to order another condenser. So that couldn't be fixed, but they will um, give me a quote and get one in and I'll just have to come back and get that done another day. For now, though, onwards. I'm heading effectively towards Gloucester, but I'm going to stop off to visit the family tonight en route. In fact, I was starting with a visit to Stroud, which is near Gloucester, and which largely involved several miles of the M5 motorway, followed by some extremely scenic A-roads, lots of rolling hills and pretty villages. I was in Stroud to look at this roundabout on the A38, but no ordinary roundabout, because what's that in the middle? Yes, it's a canal, or at least a bit of one, only as long as the roundabout is wide. It's part of a restoration of a 36-mile long canal route, linking the Gloucester and Sharpness Canal at Saul Junction to the Oxford Canal at Lechlade, and this bit under the roundabout has just been finished. The roads above would otherwise have been a massive block in the route. Incidentally, the original canal went where those trees are, but the new canal will go straight on here. A huge volunteer organisation is behind this project. Here's one of the locks they're restoring. It's 69 feet long by 16 wide, which in traditional canal style is not quite the same as every other lock on the system. Each canal builder largely used their own dimensions, which means across the country there's a hodgepodge of widths and lengths. Restoration work is slow and takes a lot of money, even with hundreds of enthusiastic volunteers. The idea of me coming along was to recce what they're up to for a future video on my Cruising the Cut channel, which I hope to go and film properly in the next two or three months. Progress takes so much time that some of these locks, having already been restored, now need further restoration and modern safety upgrades such as lock ladders, helpful for boaters and anyone who falls in. This might look like it needs a lot of work, but I'm assured this is practically ready to use all they need to do is pull the weeds out and that'll be a navigable channel. Many other miles of the restoration will need heavy-duty digging gear to remake the route. And at Christmas, that culvert under the distant railway is going to be entirely replaced with something boats can go through. A small section of the canal is ready to use and in water, and there are some trip boats using it. Recky done and I drove off to my campsite for the night, a small field on a farm with loud cows mooing on the adjacent land. No one official was to be seen and the notice on the gate instructed me to check in via text message, all due to Covid. 
There was a mix of powered and unpowered, grassy and gravel spots. I took up station right at the end and made myself comfortable. One day, each plot will be separated by these bushes, which is always nice for privacy. The shower block had a note about low water pressure any time the cows drink from their trough. The trees gave me shade while the sun continued to give me solar power. It was so hot I opened the vent, ran the fan and settled down for a nice nap. The trouble with that is that you then start to notice the spots on the ceiling that are starting to wear. Further trouble, as I realised my only food for the night and breakfast was a solitary donut. I went for a walk. The River Severn was supposedly just a few hundred yards away. And there it is, tidal on this stretch, and clearly the tide was out. Back at the van I needed tea and that doughnut, and thankfully I discovered my supper saviour with this old pack of noodles. Hurrah! I could sleep with a full tum. The next morning I showered, had a cup of tea and headed to Gloucester. Here's a tip. Never buy a Garmin sat-nav unless you have a fondness for being sent down the narrowest, windiest roads it can find even when there's a much better bit of road that would get you there in the same time. It's frustrating that while I can tell it to avoid major roads, there's no equivalent setting for single-track country lanes, which my satnav adores. There's the Severn again. And coming into Gloucester, a sudden break as you turn a corner and find oncoming traffic over a bridge. Thankfully, another van driver was kind enough to let me through. I eventually managed a right turn at this busy junction and made it to the car park I'd been aiming for, right next to Gloucester Docks. Perfect. I've not been to Gloucester before, and although I was here to film an interview with the Canal and River Trust, I had some time to kill, so wandering round the docks seemed like a good plan. Look! Narrow boats! Not narrow boats! More and moored narrow boats! In the early 1800s, Gloucester became a major inland port thanks to its connection to the wide and deep Gloucester and Sharpness Canal, which at the Sharpness end connects to the River Severn and the Bristol Channel out to the open sea. Hence all the warehouses here, where goods were unloaded and loaded, being taken on narrow boats for distribution inland to supply the industrial towns in the Midlands and the north of England. Some of those warehouses are now blocks of flats. One's the National Waterways Museum, outside which are moored a couple of boats, including this substantial dredger. It's conveyor belt buckets scooping up great loads of muck, a lot of which ends up in the basin due to silt from the river. This church was built in 1849 for the dock workers. And here's an info board. Press pause on the video to read through it. Elsewhere, a display commemorates the railways that used to run into the docks, which, as ever, competed with the canals. There are remnants maintained within the pavements. The line disappears down the side of that warehouse. 
Again, here's some info. That rather impressive road bridge is raised when boats need to pass, as with this light blue narrowboat who was waiting for the green light to go. When it was shown and the bridge raised, the boat could proceed. I wandered towards the far end of the dock, over this splendid iron bridge which clearly pivots to let boats through. I believe these are visitor moorings in the corner of the main basin. This old steam crane doesn't date from the early days of the docks, having been built in 1944 and brought here in the 90s, but it's a reminder of the kind of thing that would once have been used here. In the far corner is a lock to the River Severn, the way that narrowboats would currently make their way to the rest of the canal network from here, and vice versa. It has a rise of 12 feet 3 inches. Unlike the typical inland canal, all kinds of boats and ships are moored in the docks, this canal having a depth of 16 feet. How do you fancy buying a share of an America's Cup winner? Or an outright purchase of a 1934 Bermudan cutter? A huge dry dock on one corner was empty when I visited. The water held back, mostly, by these giant gates. And this light ship is now a floating hotel and events venue. There was just time for me to get breakfast at this empty cafe, a cupcake and a coffee, before heading to the CRT for filming. That done, I drove to Frampton on Severn nearby, which boasts the country's biggest village green. It's 22 acres. I met a friend here for a coffee and a chat in the sunshine and then later headed home. Thanks for watching. Cheerio.